Thank you, Lawrence, for the introduction. And I want to uh, thank the organizer, of course, for this uh, you know, great privilege to, to be here. This is a great meeting. Yeah, I want to go back uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, I mean, I want to go back to uh, a topic that you know, has been touched upon earlier in, this, in the morning which is the, the idea, uh, a novel modality, in my opinion, of uh, intervention uh, for aging, aging-associated diseases, and broadly speaking, other diseases like metabolic disorders uh, and uh, inflammatory uh, diseases, which is the epigenetic reprogramming or the epigenetic resetting uh, of, uh, of age. Uh, we have heard about this, as I said before, so I completely agree. My disclaimer is that I completely agree with what David Sinclair said before, uh, that you know, really this could be a paradigm shift intervention uh, and could really change the way we think about uh, treating aging, quote unquote. Now, uh, the talk one will not be you know, heavy on, on data, so if you are curious, our work has, you know, is publicly available and was, was uh, uploaded on BioArchive, so if you are interested about the nuts and bolts of the, of the, uh, the work. But what I really want to spend time uh, today uh, upon is really uh, understanding the power of this technology and understanding the applications and the implications of this technology. So as we have heard many times, uh, aging, and again, broadly speaking, other disorders, are characterized by a gradual loss of function, which occurs at the molecular, at the cellular, at the tissue, and at the organismal level. Um, but what's really striking to me is the fact that aging is characterized, well, we, we empirically see that it happens, right? But what's really striking to me is the degree of uh, uh, variability and heterogeneity of this process, which goes far beyond the genetic information. And that is true, for example, if you think about the fact that genetically identical individuals, like monozygotic twins, may age differently. Within the same body, so the, gen the genetic information uh, is the same, theoretically, but different organs age at different pace. At, at the cellular level, there is also a huge degree of heterogeneity. And as we have heard you know, brilliantly this morning, this kind of is characterized by a number of different pillars of different uh, hallmarks uh, that explain cellular heterogeneity within each organ or each tissue. So the question that I had for the past few years is, is there a unifying mechanism, is there a unifying theme that can explain heterogeneity on one hand, but also that could be potentially tackled and broadly be used as a way to, asset, to, to affect all these heterogeneous populations uh, and spectra of, of phenotypes. And being a developmental biologist, uh, I think that the answer uh, is that uh, the epigenome is that unifying theme. And as we know, this has been described by, by many people now, that as we age, and we, I mean broadly, our cells, our bodies, our tissues, uh, what, what happens is that we go from a very functional, tightly regulated epigenome, which broadly, broadly speaking refers to 3D organization of the DNA, uh, histone positioning, histone modifications, DNA methylations, and much more. We go from a very functional and regulated uh, program to a very dysfunctional and deregulated uh, program. So what David called the information loss. And the question is, is there anything that we can do actually to revert this process, to go from here to here? That's the question. And so this at the cellular level results in, for example, uh, you know, uh, replicative senescence. So as the cells, as, a as they age, they become senescent. They start secreting, as we heard, uh, you know, the, the inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and we have heard that there are actually very great studies ongoing that you know, we could potentially kill those cells selectively, reduce, get rid of them, reduce the, the, the SASP, and this could have a systemic effect. But that's not enough because you know the senescent cells, as we have heard this morning, are about only probably one percent or a little more of the cells in in our body or in an aged body. So that means that even if we kill them, there's still 
millions, trillions of cells that are left behind that are non senescent, but they're still aged. They're still dysfunctional. So what can we do there? Well, what we think we can do is, oh, there's something wrong with the, the animation. What we think we can do is that we, we can really intervene on their epigenetic profile and try to revert it back to a more functional and youthful state. And so again, just to make another, uh, you know, uh, schematic view of this process, uh, as, we, as we develop and as we age, we have this uh, modified uh, epigenetic landscape of Waddington, so we go from a very potent, high energy state, which is the zygote, down to embryonic cells, down to stem cells, down to differentiated cells, and the epigenome controls that state, so it controls cell identity. But on top of that, we have also an epigenetic drift, so a stem cell in an adult body or a differentiated cell in an adult body drifts away from its functional youthful state to a dysfunctional age state. And so again, uh, is this process re reversible? Well, being a developmental biologist by training, I know that actually this process is reversible. Absolutely, yes. Because if you think about reproduction, that's actually the method that has been put in place by evolution, by nature, actually, to keep a species young over and over and over and over. And if somebody could, would argue, well, maybe the germ cells don't age, I take it, it's not completely correct, but I take it as an argument. The counter argument is that, think about the somatic cell nuclear transfer experiment. Dolly the sheep, or, you know, Cumulina the mouse, and many others. Now, Initially, it was controversial because, you know, the data was not so clear. But now it's clear that you can take any cell of any body of any age, you transplant that nucleus into an oocyte, and you get an offspring that has a normal lifespan. That on its own tells you that whatever epigenetic information was lost during the lifespan of the donor has been completely reset to zero in the new offspring. So the epigenetic resetting of that nucleus has been complete to the point that, you know, that new organism can have a normal lifespan. And so to, and this, as, as we have heard, you know, has been replicated in vitro using iPSCs that can be, you know, used to uh, make uh, embryonic-like cells, which are by all means also younger. And so, again, the question in my lab has been for a long time, well, knowing now that we have this process of epigenetic drift, can we just focus here, okay? Can we just stay focused here? We, f we stay focused on old stem cells or we stay focused on all the differentiated cells. And can we just reverse the process of drifting? Can we make a younger version of those cells without changing their identity? That's the key concept here. So can we hijack the principles of epigenetic reprogramming that, have, that occurs during embryonic development? Can we hijack those and just use them to partially restore youthfulness in the cells without, again, changing their identity? <clears throat> and so long story short, yes, the answer is yes, it is possible. And that's the work that we have been doing both in my lab as an academic, but also at TurnBio, of which I'm a co-founder. Uh, that, that is the work that we have been doing over the past five years. Uh, so uh, it's been a long way, but it's a, it has been a long way because actually we envision this project to be clinically compatible. And we are ready to bring this to people. And I actually, I'm, I'm happy to be here because I really want to start the conversation with the FDA and I want to start you know, the interaction because this is a new uh, intervention that is ready to go to people and we need to understand and to educate, you know, we need to understand what, what's needed to bring this to people. Uh, so we have used mRNAs because they are non-integrative, okay, and they're clinically compatible. Uh, we can easily tune them, so we can easily take one factor out, add one factor in, so it's a very plastic and dynamic platform. Uh, and most importantly, it's a platform that allows us to tightly control in time and in duration for how long these factors are expressed. That's a very important aspect because if you express them for too long, you lose cell identity. You don't want that. You want to express them for a very short time to induce youthfulness without changing cell identity. And now we have now, we have now done this you know, over 
more than seven or eight different cell types, all human and all coming from naturally aged individuals. Okay? So, as I said, we have preclinical data that, are, you know, they, that, that can be used for, for this. And, and again, the data are on the paper, but what we have shown is that not only it works, not only we can make a younger version of an old cell, but we are affecting holistically and comprehensively most of the hallmarks of aging. Again, suggesting that being the epigenome, the epigenome such, a, such a core mechanism of gene regulation, if we can tweak that, we can tweak you know, broadly many other downstream uh, phenomena that are regulated by the epigenome. The only exception is telomere elongation, which is a genetic, actually, hallmark, if you think about that. Uh, and that actually, uh, that did not change with our treatment. And that's actually a good thing, because remember, what we are claiming is that we are not changing the fate. TERT is active only in stem cells. A fibroblast and endothelial cells or other cell types which are fully differentiated are not TERT positive. If we were to see telomere elongation, that would mean that we are potentially losing control of that phenomenon and we are actually changing the cell identity and potentially you know, be you know, induce a carcinogenic phenomenon, which is, again, what we don't want and what we don't get. And so I want to spend the next few minutes just to give you an idea of what we have done so far and, again, some of the implications and applications of this technology. The first one, for example, we have seen that uh, uh, in skin, using in vitro organoids, uh, so these are 3D organoids that you can, you can grow from, from primary cells obtained from any individual. So in this case, it's a 71 years old uh, individual. We get the fibroblast, we get the keratinocytes, and you can build a 3D model of the skin in vitro. That's the control, and you, know, you give to that, to that skin a numerical score that takes into account histology, number of senescent cells, and many other parameters. You can see that you know, uh, when you treat that control with other uh, you know, ingredients or molecules that are commercially available, that are at the basis of most of the anti-aging skin products that are out there, you see that of, there is an amelioration in some cases, or you know, not always, like in the retinoic acid. But when we do our treatments now, we have the, the better score among, uh, across, across all. And this is true at the histological level, but also at the molecular level. So for example, we have less senescent cells uh, comparable to other products, uh, less P16, which is a pro-senescent uh, marker, and we have reduced amounts of uh, uh, metalloproteinases, for example, uh, which indicate a better uh, extracellular matrix um, um, physiology. Second potential application, osteoarthritis. So we said, okay, if this is true for aging, so if we can make a younger version of cells, maybe by doing so we can also make a better version of cells which are affected by an aging-associated diseases. And in this case, we, looked, we isolated chondrocytes from joints of uh, patients with uh, uh, late-onset uh, osteoarthritis. We isolated the cells and we either left them untreated or we treated them with our you know, cocktail of factors for a very short time. And sure enough, we could see that uh, there is a reduction in the pro-inflammatory cytokines or in the pro-inflammatory cyto uh, profile, I should say, increased cell proliferation, increased levels of ATP at the cellular level, decreased ROS, increased antioxidants, and most importantly, we do not see any change in the genetic or in the transcriptional, uh, in, in, the, in those genes that actually define the identity of those cells. Again, suggesting that the cells are more performant, more functional, more fit, younger, but still the same cell type. So we have not changed their identity. And last but not least, we did this in, uh, uh, in muscle. So in collaboration with Tom Rando, uh, we did uh, we isolated, in this case you see mouse stem cells, but we isolated um, uh, satellite cells. And again, we left them untreated or treated, and then before it, we transplanted them into an aged host immunocompromised mouse. And then we followed them up for like a month and, and did an endpoint analysis. And I think this is really striking. We saw that by, by, by treating the cells actually, we could bring them back in time and restore the force 
that a young, untreated mouse uh, has. And I don't have the time to show it here, but we have shown that actually this is, you know, can be persistent. So even two months after the treatment, we still see the same, the same effect. And so I just want to leave you with this, you know, uh, visualiza visualization of the concept of uh, uh, epigenetic uh, rebooting, or as we call it, epigenetic annealing of the cells. So this is kind of a, an idea that comes from the, the metallurgy, uh, which is the concept that, you know, if you have a metal or if you have any other, you know, substance uh, with some uh, errors in the structure, which is how you could picture, for example, an H cell, so errors in the epigenome, you can actually bring that, that uh, metal to a higher uh, energy level, uh, which where basically you have um, uh, an opening up of the, of the chromatin structure and then a, a natural annealing that reverts back the structure to you know, a more functional uh, and low energy state. So that's exactly what we think is happening with our technology. We obviously need to understand, you know, the mechanisms behind, but what's happening is that by, by uh, epigenetically shocking these cells, for a very, very short time, the cells get to this slightly higher energy state and then they fall back into a more functional state. But that's, that epigenetic shock is not big enough actually to change completely their, their program and their identity. And with that, that's you know, how we see the future. Uh, so as we age, oops, sorry. As we age uh, or, you know, as we develop other disorders, what happens is that the cells of the body change their epigenome. Some of them become senescent. Some of them do not become senescent or most of them do not become senescent, but they still age. So as we said, you know, we can come in, kill the senescent cells, for example, get rid of the SASP, and this has a systemic effect. But again, the, the, the remaining cells are still aged. And so, and that's where basically our technology can come in and potentially rejuvenate the, the, remain, the remaining cells and re bring them back in, in time. So with that, I wanna thank all the people that actually made this, part, this work possible uh, on, the, on the academic side, Jay, which uh, you know, has been the main driver, uh, and Marco, which are also the two co-founders of the company. And on the, on the company side, I want to particularly thank Gary, Sergio, uh, Dave Gobble, and the Methuselah Foundation and the Methuselah Fund. And I just want to leave you with this movie that really nicely, you know, kind of conceptualized what I've been talking about. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>